Cool. All right. So welcome to the July community chat. Um, we are we are back in uh, Jitsi land, um, and seem to things seem to be working. Um, and uh, after after I tried to break everything last month, so um, thanks for everyone who could show up. Um, and we're here today to kind of talk about uh, the kind of two things. So we we gave a presentation uh, a couple months ago, and we're gonna probably give similar ones um, at a couple other conferences throughout the year around the idea of reclaiming our social presence, basically, as a company, we meant in our case. But um, really the idea of more broadly, oh my God. <laughs> That's awesome. I, I'm, I'm just gonna uh, vamp for Taylor right now. I think someone broke into his house. It's, we so might sorry. be able to get some I don't know if you all can hear that. Um, good. But uh, very sorry. Uh, we have a weather radio that we just got, and I put it in monitor mode and forgot about it a week ago. And uh, there's apparently a weather alert. That was very loud. <laughs> um, okay, so <laughs> but you're not a geek at all. Uh, no, not at all. <laughs> um, that that's uh, um, yeah. We got bought that for camping. We got to test it out. Uh, it works. I, I forgot. Forgot. I put it in that mode. Um, so. Thank you all for tolerating the interruption. <laughs> um, but yeah, I wanted to talk about uh, kind of some of the stuff we talked um, kind of talk about our um, presentation we gave around this a little bit, but then, you know, open it up to talk a little bit more broadly about um, kind of what's going on with, you know, social networks uh, in general and people's how they're using them, where they're going, um, if, you know, if they're if they're migrating off Twitter, where are they going? And because I actually think it's an interesting um, it's an interesting thing to discuss because, as far as I'm concerned, it's not a move from Twitter or whatever platform to another. It's for most people a change in mentality about how they interact online and it's you know it's hey now i do this this and this or i'm pulling back entirely i think i haven't heard a single person who's got the same story around this stuff so um i thought that would be kind of an interesting thing to discuss we have kind of talked a little bit about some of this stuff in other contexts um on reclaim tv and things like that but we haven't had a community chat about this type of thing in, in a while um so that's kind of what i'm hoping to talk about um, I am going to share my screen here really quick and just kind of set the stage. Um, if you're curious, we did a presentation back in April and we, we of course blogged it because did it even happen if we didn't blog it? Um, and uh, <laughs> uh, I've got a link here to, um, to the blog post that we put out there with our slides and things like that. But um, I'm going to kind of go through this pretty quickly um but we in this presentation sort of talked about our journey as a, as a company um and tried to relate that to you know um things people could take away as individuals or maybe like a department or a project if you have that you're managing that has a social presence and what we've been doing and learning and um, what's been working what hasn't um for us so um we kind of talked about as a company we were using Twitter quite a bit. Um, and we, of course, all, we have a strong presence at Reclaim of, of blogging, specifically Jim. Um, but, but that was kind of as a presence, um, just about it for, for Reclaim hosting. We were using Twitter for short stuff. We had blog posts, we had announcements on our uh, website on occasion, but it wasn't um, something we were putting a lot of time and energy into. Um, and over time, we, uh, especially when we started doing more stuff like we are now with community chats and um, some of the flex courses and things, we decided that we really needed to uh, have a better platform for promoting that those types of events and work we were doing um, to kind of make the most of it. Um, so we started getting more serious about it. And the more serious we got, we realized that it was kind of important for us to own parts of this. Um, and and because of course we can't own Twitter necessarily. Uh, we can't own, um, you know, 
a, a lot of these social networks. And so right away, an obvious thing we did is we we did, you know, make our own um, Mastodon server and and post on that. And that's great for people that are on Mastodon or other Fediverse tools and know about that. But I would argue that that's sort of one specific type of person who's paying attention there, at least right now. Um, and so then we kind of thought more more uh, about what uh, we could do beyond that. And the real obvious thing to us was to put more effort into the blog and newsletter stuff, because I think that is even larger space that people understand and and um, can participate in. And so we kind of doubled down on the the monthly newsletter that we already had been doing, but added to that a company blog that we um, update more frequently and um, kind of share in that process throughout the company a little bit more. And even further, we went into uh, what it meant to own our own video content too. So we, we've been doing um, video content on YouTube. We're not moving away from YouTube anytime soon. There's a lot of benefits from being there, but we added in a workflow that would make it easier for us to be on uh, YouTube as well as the Fediverse with video and stuff that we can own uh, our own domain for and even store copies of our videos and things like that. Um, if you're curious about the video stuff, I, I don't think I'm gonna, unless someone really wants to talk about like the technicals of that, um, we can, but um, I did do a whole stream a few weeks ago on how we do our streams and that is a pretty, a uh, detailed overview of all the tools we use to do that and how it works. And I even made a somewhat confusing diagram of how that works for us, um, if you're curious about that. Um, but I'll leave that um, in the chat here too. Um, and yeah, I mean, that's that's um, really the, the, the kind of gist of it is sort of this is, the, the journey for us has been not, um, one of you know moving to one place but by diversifying essentially and making sure that many or as many of those spaces as possible are ones that we have control over um so that that's been kind of what we've done and um what i wanted to talk about is if anyone else is kind of working through this as an individual or a, an organization of some kind and what they've found what they've been learning things like that and I also just spent the first 10 minutes of this talking completely. So I don't want to completely dominate from here. But yeah, how have, been, how have people been finding themselves dealing with transitions in social spaces and things like that? I'll go. I'll say something quickly. Just I'm, I like it a little bit, the kind of, you know, uh, how would you say the dust up that is Twitter? Because, you know, for a long time, the main site has been my blog. And there's a, I mean, it's kind of a half hearted return to the blog effort. But at the same time, there is a sense that, all right, where am I going to put my stuff and, you know, track my thinking and do that stuff? And so I, I mean, I'm just sitting and waiting, you know kind of like a weird survivalist on the on the edges for people to return to their blog and for us to <laughs> comment again and but i i mean i i also think that you know the lessons to be learned about centralizing these major networks um and commercializing them is real impact on you know how we relate in these public spaces so yeah it's a it's an ongoing thing but there's not too much i miss in terms of what I posted on Twitter, I just missed the, the place to hang out with other people and share quickly. And Mastodon's so much slower. And in some ways that's nice because there's very little overhead and drama, but at the same time, you know, <laughs> yeah. I think there's definitely something that echoes the web, right? Like in that, like people move from this place to many places. And I like, like as a technologist, I like that. Like, it's like, yeah, it's really great that we're seeing people wind in m many spaces. I see people complain about that, and I understand that completely. But also, I'm kind of like, but isn't that how this is supposed to work, <laughs> you know, a little bit? Um, 
but I would agree that on the other hand, it, it is like Twitter at its best could feel like a hangout place. And I don't know that that exists in the same way, at least in all the communities that I was, you know, watching on Twitter. Okay, well, I'll say uh, it's confusing. There's too many places, and since Twitter blew up, people have decamped to different places, and I get to chase all around to find them. Um, so I just discovered um, OctaVibe, OpenVibe. It has a little octopus, and it links you to Mastodon and blue sky and no stir which i just discovered which is even more confusing so <laughs> what, what uh, was that open open what open vibe and there's two of them oh. of course so it's the one with the little <laughs> cute octopus let me okay. double check that i just found it but it's it's like the twitter dashboard kind of thing oh um yeah, open vibe. Um, and so you can see it's it's only a, it's only a phone app and I spend most of my time on my desktop, so it's not that useful. But um, yeah. So the other thing I would say is um, I pulled back like everybody did, I guess. First we did we spent too much time because we we're all locked down and then we all pulled back. And so now you can't find anybody. And then it exploded across the Fediverse. So uh, it's hard to find people. Um, so uh, I look to you guys uh, for inspiration or leadership or whatever. So now I have Ghost installed and I have PeerTube installed in my Reclaim Cloud. There's an advertisement. Um, yeah. Um, but we're not even paying you. Uh, yeah, I know you and a lot of other people. Um, so now I have to figure out how to link all those together and try to get a semi automated workflow. And I really want a uh, archival version. So I've been reading about how I can use the Hugo API to link that to my ghost so that when I post on ghost, it will automatically create a Hugo page, which I can then archive locally because it's just a flat file. And I'm not really a computer scientist, so I don't find this all that fascinating. It sounds cool, though, Mark. <laughs> One of the things I will mention, and this is specific to what you just mentioned about Ghost, is they do have, right in the web interface, a thing that lets you export your entire ghost as a JSON file, kind of like WordPress's XML export. Um, and I would recommend that because that includes your posts and all of the settings. The only thing it doesn't include is pictures or attachments, I guess, but that's a folder that can be copied or zipped up. Um, and I've, I've been messing around with ghost more and more and I actually want to use that feature that it has to do some kind of automated backup of that. That's not even in a database, which is nice. It's just a file that could be, you know, you could bring that to ghosts um, hosting that they offer um, pro, I think they call it. Um, and I like that. I always like to have that kind of, you know, here's a text file with all my stuff in it <laughs> kind of thing. Yeah. That's the, you know, that's the archival version. You know, there's not that much conversation. Well, over on the digital humanities side, there's a conversation about archiving this stuff. So, um, so I spend time over there or wherever that is. Um, and so that's a feature I wanted. Um, and then I have an Omeka instance already installed, but it's not in the cloud. So I don't know if that'll work or what I have to do. But um, Omeka is really good at uh, ontologies and metadata. And so if you could somehow run your posts through Omeka, you could then attach the standard Dublin core or other um, internationally recognized 
uh, metadata and attach it so that then your stuff is really searchable in a way that blog posts aren't unless you're really good at keyword tagging, which I'm not. Um, so that's another thought. And, um, and then I have a Substack instance, so I guess I could repost the ghost of the Substack because that's people are far more likely to find it there and on and on and on. Do you see any promise? And this is a general question. Um, like I know ghost and other tools like WordPress and, you know, blue sky or even meta are talking about, you know, getting into the Fediverse and allowing you to follow various people across various pro it's, it's kind of like the hope of RSS reading, right? I can see them wherever and I subscribe to who I want to, but now using, uh, this new protocol, um, that's what I'm hoping to kind of land slowly is that I don't, it doesn't matter where I'm living. I can follow the people I'm interested in uh, wherever they're posting, whether it's Ghost, whether it's PeerTube, whether it's Facebook. You know, I, I don't want to be in those places, but I would certainly like to know what certain people there are doing and follow them. So I don't know. You know, there's a lot of, you know, reasons and it was kind of the death of the API, right? Reasons to kind of you know, make that possible, but a lot of reasons also to shut it down by these companies. And I know a lot of people are like, it's now changing. It's in good faith. Meta is really going to do that. And I just know where that's going to go. Yeah. Right. So I, that's kind of what I'm waiting on a little bit, Mark. And personally, I don't mind the, the kind of quietude that the disbursement right now has, has resulted in because you know, I kind of learned like Alan Levine, the return to the blog and just kind of stay where you are and then figure out what comes. So it's interesting. I absolutely. I'll stop speaking, Christine, because I want you to speak. All right. Um, so I I was on Twitter and I I loved it and I I quit and, and I missed it for a while. But what I didn't really miss was the negativity. Um, as a PhD candidate, um, you can get sucked down the hole, I think, of the, the, um, the negatives of doing a PhD and people who are falling apart. And, and it's very easy to do, but I did use it to share some of that knowledge and experience as well. So I miss having a platform for that. I've been trying to do more things on um, LinkedIn, but I still tend to just lurk on there. I, I don't think I use it to the capacity that I should. And then I've been working on um, AI, or sorry, VR, AI as well, but VR. And I was wondering about the potential of something like frames for creating a digital space where you could pull things together that you're wanting to look at, maybe in a sort of like an amped up um, social place, right? Uh, frames can be used, and I'm just starting to look at frames, but it can be used it's tool agnostic. You can use it on your computer. You don't necessarily have to have a headset because the headset makes me kind of sick. Um, but yeah, that's all I was thinking about as you were speaking. I'm still, my, my son has like three VR tools. Like it has the meta one, the recent one, and then the old HTC one. And I'm super interested in VR because I always am like, this is the year. I'm always saying to him, like, this is the year the, the game or the app is going to come out and we're going to see that jump. And uh, I think the hard part there is the software or the hardware, right? Because even though you can do VR in the web, it, it doesn't feel like native and you kind of almost have to, you know, add another layer to it and then to have the headsets and be able to like socialize in some way depends upon a lot of infrastructure and purchasing, right? Like you have to have the money to buy these headsets, which aren't cheap. And so I haven't seen, I, I like the idea of VR, but I haven't seen that link where I could feel like, oh, I'm going to put on my VR and then feel socially like watch a movie with someone, right? Like they have that thing, like Tim and my old partner and I used to go into a movie theater in VR and watch a movie together. And it was a strange, interesting experience, but like it never did, it, it never did kind of click like something like Twitter, right? Like, which was so easy. It took very little 
right? It was just, no, like you said, it was a great platform for sharing and very little resistance, but there was the doom mongers that come on there and all that. So anyway, I, I'm interested in what that is. I just haven't seen VR really getting over that hill despite its promise. So we had a, I had a demo of frames and I participated not with my headset, but I just was on my computer and it felt very um, second life like, like I, I kind of like that. It was low tech, but getting in there, you're right. Like, like um, Twitter was so much more simple. It's on your phone. You can just use it. It's right there. So yes, uh, something like that was still needed. That's, that's really interesting. I'll have to look at frame. I haven't heard of that or frames before. I haven't, I haven't heard of that before, but it is interesting that you said that it can also be an option. It, it works when you're not using a VR headset too. And I think that's a huge, huge piece that's going to be kind of vital for anything like, like that space to take off because VR headsets are really cool, but they're, you know, it's a thing to use them and many people cannot use them even not talking about cost, right? Um, just like physically. <laughs> um, and um, so th that's like a whole thing that would be, you know, in in my view, um, a non-starter for enough people, um, and, my, and myself included. Like I, I just don't find VR headsets very comfortable after a while, which is just like a minor problem. Um, but um, I do think that um, that stuff is solvable like if, you know, with time and technology, if we want to, but I'm not even sure if that'll happen. Like, it, it, you know, like it, people have talked about like augmented reality glasses that are literally the size of glasses and that maybe that's something, but, um, but something like, like if something like frames can bridge across different modes of interaction, that's, that's huge, I think. Um, and if it's compelling. Sorry, and then are you are you looking at LinkedIn at all as a platform? Because uh, that's kind of where I think most people went from my experience, but I don't know. Give you my highly opinionated. <laughs> that's 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 above my normal opinionated view. <laughs> um, and and I can see like why it would be valuable for people. Uh, particularly if you're pursuing career stuff. But I think that that kind of, for me, is what makes it such a horrible, horrible place of just self-congratulatory posts, then with additional congratulations and handshakes from people in an endless cycle of just self-congratulations. Some of them often from people who are selling the things Others from people who are buying the things, all saying how great the things are in this giant circle of, uh, not jerks, but um, congratulations. Um, and, you know, like I said, I was going to be highly opinionated. I'm going to spice this uh, spice this meeting up for you, Jim. Um, and I, like I said, like if I was like desperate for a job right now or not even desperate or seeking one, I mean, that's the place I'd go because, I mean, it's just kind of smoothing and all that sort of stuff. But I don't, I mean, I see people whose controversial take is going to be the popular controversial take about something that is not on LinkedIn and is not for sale. They'll have a take on that in an article and it just breaks my heart to see all this energy time and people kind of being being spent in yet another place that is going to be you know destroyed at some point or another by someone um you know and but i see the problems too like i mean when i write something on mastodon like it's just like i blogged it but <laughs> no one's gonna say anything to that problem <laughs> and you know and it's kind of confusing and if you don't know the people already like connecting to them is hard i mean to me mastodon is just like regular blogging only shorter and you get to use the word mastodon at least which is kind of cool but you know it's, it's it didn't solve any of the problems it just kind of does it in a slightly new space with fewer characters so there's there's my hot take 
I if, haven't, I'm sorry, go ahead. Well, uh, I was just going to say if, and this is a big if, um, the political cultures around the world weren't run by 80 year olds, there might be a push to make at least national, if not transnational, uh, free and open platforms that would aggregate the stuff for us and translate it. Why not? Um, but the world's run by 80 year olds. And so that's just a ridiculous idea. One one thing that it's not exact. Um, I, I agree with what you said, <laughs> but first of all, but one thing I think is interesting. It's like a quarter measure, quarter step measure to that is because threads has limited federation stuff. Now people can opt into it. And all it, I think all it does right now is it means if you have a threads account and you click a checkbox, people using Fediverse tools can follow, but they can't interact yet. Um, but that's apparently coming in limited fashions over time, but whatever. The the POTUS account is opted into that. So I can follow that account from Mastodon, which I find really interesting. Um, and it's, it's sort of, to me, like a very small you know version of what I'd love to see. Like I, I think it would make sense for institutions and uh, possibly governments to have their own, like if they need this space that, you know, that they would use a tool like Mastodon, maybe, maybe it directly or something else that could be followed by multiple things. You know, people could get updates from this via maybe email or, um, you know, by following it via a Fediverse compatible tool or even RSS. Um, all of that could be interesting. I would love to see it not owned by Meta. Um, that would be cool. <laughs> um, but uh, even this version of it, I think, is is interesting um, as it stands, anyway. Yeah, I um, <clears throat> uh, I think I think this sort of engagement really peaked the high water mark for this was internet relay chat so <laughs> um i i don't think that anything has really gotten any better uh in terms of uh, finding and engaging with people um i don't know maybe maybe bulletin board systems were the were the high water mark but uh um i've sort of just seen these cycles come and go i'm old enough now to know that um i'm not hitching my wagon to another another platform um and i've really enjoyed um um sort of taking an extended break it's um it's i'm coming up on the 18 month mark and i i i do miss the engagement a lot but i don't miss um you know uh, a lot of other elements of uh of twitter in particular so i don't know what to do i was i am uh, enamored with Obsidian. I really wish that there was a way to easily push the kind of writing that I'm doing there for myself now to uh, some spot um, on the web. I don't know what it is about um, blogging. I think having done it in my work life uh, for a couple of years just sort of um, changed my brain. And I don't, um, I don't approach it uh, with the kind of um, ease and um, openness that I used to, because I, I still feel like there is a, a professional or a possibility of a professional type reader of what I would put there out there. Um, and the, the problem with sort of like going underground with uh, uh, something else is that no one would know you and you're basically just kind of writing for yourself, which is what I've been doing for um, all of this time since I got off of Twitter and everything. You know, one of the things that occurs to me is in the early days of blogging, there was a lot um, made of um, blog circles um, and the sort of um, uh, promotion that happened um, around different communities to encourage people to find and read other people's work. And, um, you know, librarians call those reader advisory services and they're really, really old. Um, and I think that were I to get back into uh, this sort of thing, one of the things that I would take on would be to make a regular kind of a post 
be, hey, look at these other things. Look at these other things I've found. Um, and I think it's that kind of promotion that really made Twitter successful uh, when it sort of began to build. And there were parts of the interface that made it easy for you to see who others were following, um, which was, I think, the strength for me anyway of that platform. That's what I would like um, is just the discovery services that would be available and whatever could replace it. If if something like that could could materialize, I think I think everything else might fall into place for me. I love your idea about like linking like the old school link sites, right? Like there you go. Link out to this. See that. Like I miss the blog roll. I miss, you know, there was a sense of what didn't have to be you know, thousands and tens of thousands like it was on Twitter, like sometimes 50, 20, 30 people who, you know, were reading and communicating. Like I was a big fan of Info Cult when it was out there. And, you know, I did a lot of like commenting and like I, I feel like sometimes and whether it's perceived or whether it's real, uh, we feel a lot more isolated on the Web, you know, post these huge social media, you know, reformations and. I think, Tim, to your point, like, you know, rethinking, like, you know, it starts small and just a few people linking and whatever tool, it doesn't have to be blogging and talking. Um, there's a lot of power in that. And it kind of just returns to some of the more, um, I don't know, basic instincts of trying to connect genuinely online, which when we talked about LinkedIn, one of the problems there is nothing feels genuine. Like everybody wants something from you or vice versa. And so, you know, sure, we all have to, you know, ply our trade, but that's not where I want to make a real meaningful, authentic connection. So yeah, some of the best stuff I ever found was back in the days of social bookmarking and sites like Delicious or whatever. You know, it doesn't even necessarily have to be content that you're creating it's just you know what's your brain work and an ability to kind of find a person that you admire and respect and follow along you know uh what where they're headed and and what they're finding and what they think is important and um so for yeah um for whatever it's worth that's what i'm seeking and and missing the most since my uh sort of going offline i would definitely second that too like for for that for especially for my first couple years out of college, but still to this day, I feel like that is where I get most of my, like, uh, I don't know what the word is, but it, it's, it's the network that I'm seeking. I'm really interested in finding folks whose work I really enjoy and just seeing what they're reading like that. That's and and find interesting right now. And so like, I mean, for me, that's RSS and following people's like blog posts. But you know, there's fo some folks uh, use um, uh, what's the pinboard um, and and stuff like it. And I really like that stuff. I like checking in on that stuff too because I find that interesting. I use a one called Raindrop that's very similar. Um, and I have always wanted to start doing like a weekly link blog, but never quite do it. Uh, <laughs> but I enjoy folks that do like Tom's, but there's plenty of other people that do. Um, so I don't know. I, I always feel like for me, the answer to this stuff is like RSS feeds and has been forever. And I, I know people like to talk about that, how RSS is dead and I don't completely agree. I think it's not visible. Um, and that's that's hard, and I'm sure it's less popular than it was at one point, but maybe by percentage. I'm not I'm not sure about by numbers though. Um, and I, you know, I guess it to me always comes like the same answer of like, oh, maybe we should be talking about how we all use RSS more. And, and for folks that don't know, here's a thing, and it's been around forever, and tons of things support it, and and all that kind of stuff, but. That's always my answer to these things is sort of like informal education. I'm not 100% sure that maybe I'm just naive. Um, so, but I, I will just say that I also find that very valuable, Tim, is like the idea of what are what are people I respect and I'm interested in their work? What are they reading right now? And, and obviously what their take on it is also good, but sometimes just knowing what they're reading is interesting to me. Well, let me, let me see if this resonates with you, because this is something I've been thinking about 
because pattern wise, it's like once a once you've had the Twitter crack juice or the Facebook particular heroin blend, you know, like I feel like it's hard to get people to come clean ever again and have like a wholesome, hardworking life on the farm um, because you don't get these crazy hits and spikes in the same way. And so, you know, it's a bit like, you know, we had taxis and they sort of worked. It was a little bit of a struggle. And then Uber comes in, breaks all the rules, kind of undercuts it, waits till the taxis are destroyed. People don't know about them anymore. And then jacks the prices up. And that's kind of what I feel like the social networks do. It kind of works. It does a number of the things we're talking about. Discovery is easy communities are better you get your dopamine hits in a variety of ways sure you undermine democracy you know you do some other stuff as a byproduct but then they even screwed that up so it doesn't work effectively anymore and that's kind of where i feel like we are but i just don't know how to i don't know that you will ever get people back it just makes me mad that we had stuff that did a lot of these things but now we kind of ignore it like it's a problem that needs to be solved anew. Like when is Uber three coming out or Twitter mock seven? And like, it's just, we did that. We have an answer. This is embarrassing. Does no one remember history? It could be because I'm an old man yelling at a cloud and a history major, but like, that's how I feel about it. So when are the trust busters going to come in? You know, um, well, isn't that we were just that, what Rockefeller did? Isn't that happening now with uh, 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 the FTC um, is uh, looking at um, Google, right? Yeah, but that's not. I, uh, so I guess I should have couched mine. When does the social movement? When do the people like us demand? that these trusts be broken up yeah there i mean you know but then yeah that those people at the ftc will be replaced next I year think, probably well most likely yeah no I, I i think there's i think there's no social movement for that right now in, in 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 part because i think a lot of the left have given up on economics and this is also complicated it involves law it involves regulation it's uh it's terrible for sound bites it's hard to do on TikTok. um yeah tom i um i named my cat after hunter s thompson uh, that's the kind of journalist I want, um, you know, but but now it's about access journalism um, and, you know, you have to get close to it. I, I'm sorry to lean in on the mic here. Uh, I, no, I, I'm, I'm coming in late because I was in a meeting. We would love that you came. And I mean, that point that we were talking about when I was talking with my wife last night about uh, the FTC stuff and them $26 billion, I think, for something like Wizard or Wiz or mm -hmm. some big cybersecurity company. And it just, you know, when you throw out those numbers, it's just like, you know, we kind of sold the whole system down the river. And while we were all kind of navel gazing, these companies got too big to regulate, right? Like, I don't know if this is Rockefeller era stuff, but like, think about the, the value and the economics of a lot of these companies. It's like imposing, if not scary, to think there's a way back. So... Well, there's uh, there's a big push now about screen time uh, for kids, and that's mostly focused on cell phones, which is probably the only time people won't say iPhone when they mean cell phones. Because, uh, but it, um, but that's that's one connection. You know, when people are talking about worrying about phones, they're mostly worried about social media. Um, but uh, but also, I guess the other problem is that you know these are these are very large companies. Um, they have a lot of uh, a lot of stuff but there's no there's no monopoly in social media i mean facebook is the is the giant but it's clearly got competition um and then and then you know maybe the maybe geopolitics is the way to do it uh you know the congress and many states pass stuff against TikTok, uh, which i consider social media and that's still in the air i mean no one's bought it yet so you know that could be you know shut down well but there's a criticism of that I won't go into it, but um, oh, um, sure, sure. I mean, I'm, I'm, I, I don't. I'm, I'm just saying, if, if you, you want know, the anti-China point of view, um, well, it's uh, that's that right now is a mainstream bipartisan view. 
Um, and, uh, you know, it's been mainstream through four presidents. And um, right now I'm working on Project 2025, working through it closely. And it is laser focused on China. I mean, they are obsessed with China. Uh, and the Democrats are too. I mean, Biden organized this gigantic global alliance against China. Um, you know, uh, uh, Obama tried to, uh, and, you know, Trump, who knows, but he definitely likes to smack China whenever he can. Um, so, I mean, it's, it's kind of hard to, it's, it's hard to miss. It hasn't, it hasn't turned into a, a horrible red baiting force in the U S yet. Um, you know, I don't know if the anti TikTok move will be a step in that direction, but you know, but this, this is one, um, I don't mean to get off topic. Sorry. I, I, um, uh, well, I let me see if I can uh, lead us back in a, in a way I on, only I would do, I suppose. But, um, you know, um, the one thing that links all of these not monopolies is uh, they're all from Surveillance Valley. You know, they're all fully integrated with the state. Let's just say that. We won't go any further than that. Um, and so that's a problem that's, you know, that's a wicked problem. Um, because even if you go in and break them up, you could, you know, it's like the old, I'm old enough. I remember when AT&T got broken up. Well, at and still around. It re, re, um, aligned itself and found markets and carried on. Um, and so if these are broken up, that will happen, but they will all still be integrated with the state. And now it's even getting interesting. Which state are they most aligned with? Another reason to look for alternatives, but as we were discussing before you got here, Brian, they're scattered all over the place. They're hard to find. And, um, you know, I hate to go to a different platform for every person I want to talk to. I also feel, and this could be my again this is complete completely anecdotal but i i feel like there is less desire for the amongst most people that i don't know from the internet right most most of my friends family whatever there there is more desire for more private conversations and private spaces um than ever and i don't know that it's necessarily a bad thing um it's just that's my perception. Um, and I, I don't know if there's a trend I can point to to say this is why or this is why not necessarily. Um, but I think that has a small role in some of this um, that I feel like is probably only going to grow over time. Again, purely from the measuring the temperature of people I talk to in Wisconsin. <laughs> so um, maybe that's just my corner, but. So our only hope is that China buys more companies, then we can make China the enemy, ban and regulate the companies. Whereas I think Canada can just put the US as the bad person and then ban all of their stuff and regulate it. Or the EU, I think that they're already on the easier spot. So I don't know, time to immigrate. Interesting that the, the pointing of like WhatsApp and Telegram, like, EU, I'm in Italy and everything is WhatsApp, but that's the network and it's encrypted. And as much as it's a Facebook property, it's also like AT&T, like the infrastructure and reliability of it is amazing. So like there is to the point where you see that there are outages of WhatsApp and countries a little bit shut down. <laughs> Right, which is not good. It never <laughs> happens. That's the other thing. It's like they've had how many outages in years? It's like really remarkable. True. And so that whole idea of displacing, you know, these utilities. And I've always been fascinated about the utility argument that came up in the 60s around the internet. It's like, at what point do we treat it like a utility? And do we regulate it like a utility? Wi-Fi, access, all of that. Um, and then also kind of give it to the socialist state of kind of fund some of that utility so that we're not, um, you know, coming up with the kind of venture capital of free for all that we have. So 
that's always been an interesting idea. And there was a guy in the 60s who wrote a book about the internet as utility very early on. I think it was like 68, 69. Um, that I talked about a bit with the internet course. I can't remember the book, but it's basically laying out the whole framework of what this will be and why we need to get in front of this now uh, and not listen to, obviously. But it's interesting kind of, you know, alternative future. If we were thinking at that point, what if we thought of the internet like this versus this, you know? I'd like to read that book. If you can remember, I will find, find it. it. I have it here somewhere, so I'll find it and send it to you, Mark. I'll kind of Thanks. post about it. It's actually maybe it's good fodder for a post too, but I will. Yeah, I was hoping to reread the uh, Johnson administration's uh, cybernetic revolution report. Um, I mean, I'm hopefully, get to do that next year. Hadn't heard of that either. Yeah, it's, I think it's called the Three Revolutions. I'll find it for you. So I'm looking forward to your uh, reading of Project 2025, if this doesn't just take the whole conversation in the wrong direction. But um, I'm a little confused. Are we supposed to sign up someplace or just email you or comment on the post? Or uh, You can comment on posts. So for everybody else, if you haven't seen this, uh, I'm launching a public reading of Project 2025. That's the Heritage Foundation's book uh, aimed at the uh, Trump campaign. Um, and uh, so basically every week for the next uh, it was like 10 weeks or so, um, I'll just post on a swath of the book um, and people can respond with comments on that blog post or they can post elsewhere uh, on social media, their own sites. And, uh, and I'll uh, aggregate those responses as I can uh, for the next week. Uh, I'm reaching out to Heritage Foundation to get someone there to be a speaker. Uh, on video about this, as well as a bunch of uh, political scientists to uh, to talk about it. Uh, so, if if I have time, we can we can try and arrange that. Um, you so can, it's all asynchronous. There aren't there aren't any. Um... Well, the I I'm hoping to do a forum session on it if if I can if we can get the the right people for it. So that'd be the synchronous one. Um, the uh, uh, you should be able to subscribe by email to get updates on my blog as a whole if you haven't already. Um, yeah. Just every, every just just so you know, Mark is among other things the keenest eyed reader of my stuff. He he, he has a an, an unbelievable way to find uh, to find glitches. Uh, and Tom just, <laughs> and, and Tom just shared the uh, shared a link to it. So thanks, Tom. Thanks for that. I was hoping that you would do like a Dracula like blog of the Heritage twenty twenty five report. Um, and so, like you know, going and you know, he's going to Transylvania. What does he find? And he reports um, back. Yeah, that's fun. <laughs> that that's would be fun. fun. Uh, the thing is, it's it's nine hundred pages, um, oh, and uh, and some of it is is here. I've got uh, um, the excellent historian Rick Perlstein is talking about having to prop up his eyes with toothpicks in order to to work through some of it. Um, uh, but one thing I was thinking of was actually doing a, a, an email newsletter uh, copy of it, um, just for people who like that. Um, so I'm, I'm thinking of trying out a new one, like uh, you know, like Beehive or something. I haven't tried yet. Yeah, I think so, it'd be uh, really useful to like, like you're saying, with a newsletter or whatever, just to give people that thirty thousand view of what you're thinking, what you've seen, summarize. Like you do that great in your post TLDR. Here's what my post's about, and then you go through course. it. That would be a brilliant way to kind of, you know, share what you find, um, because people won't read the 900 pages for sure. Yeah, I mean, so it's it's kind of funny. This is aimed at Trump, right? You know, who's who's famously illiterate, but um, but the idea is that it's, it's it's aimed at all the people around him, you know. Um, and so far, I mean, what I've read is it, it's one part terrifying and one part it's excellent. I mean, for what it's supposed to do. I mean, they're they're going through the the government and they're just meticulously pulling all the levers, identifying all the points. I mean, it's it's a really handy document. Um, but uh, sorry, Tom, about the U.S. centric stuff. You know, but um, as as Billy Bragg once said, he didn't want to leave his country because if he did, he'd be subjected to its foreign policy. Yeah. 
Yeah, the Pearlstein uh, article that you, uh, the link that you put in your post, which I think the post is there. Oh yeah, Tom put it there. Um, yeah, I'm, I'm a big Pearlstein fan and that was an excellent yeah. post. Um, yeah, he's, a, he's a terrific writer. And then he linked to a Tom Gans, Jim Gans, somebody named Gans post that also said, you know, the Republic has been doing this since the 50s or something, how they're going to realign the government. And they put out these reports, but, <laughs> you know, um, the surveillance state, you know, is resistant to change. Uh, yeah, it is. It is. I, I just I just got asked to uh, to help uh, the uh, American Association of Colleges and Universities do a asynchronous slash synchronous faculty development program on AI and uh, pedagogy and AI and, and uh, uh, course development. So I'm, I mean, as in that was the meeting just before this. So, uh, um, so that's going to be fun because I, you know, I get to mention things like uh, geopolitics and uh, I'll probably scare the hell out of them, but um, it'll, it'll be fun to do. See, Jim, I never leave InfoCult behind. I know. I'm waiting for the peak oil reference. I, I've got that in my uh, in my new book, um, in the introduction. I figured. I mean, the whole idea of the you know, university on fire and the environment and your ongoing you know discussion of that um, in your various blogs as I followed them over the years, perfect fit for you. And I really loved yes. you know the way you tied that on, and you were a major hit amongst the folks at Reclaim. Um, who are in general significantly younger than my old ass, and they were like very taken with um, your ideas there, the solar punk reference and all that stuff. It's awesome. Well, thanks, thanks. This is uh, this is uh, this is the stuff, um, and uh, and I, I want to do more of it. But speaking of more of it, I'm going to have to run because I've got a one o'clock meeting. Hardest working man in ed tech. This there is he is. Watch this him is go. It's not as cool as you guys. <laughs> um, in, in all seriousness, I, I hope you all, uh, if you're in uh, afflicted areas, I hope you're all safe and sound um, and, uh, and uh, physically cool. Uh, yeah. we, we got a heat index of 105 here right now. So. Holy hat. What is going on in Virginia? I'm in Italy, and it's been beautiful in the mountains, but I keep on getting every day from Fredericksburg the heat advisory warning. I'm like, what? Another time? Again? Well, last a, a year ago when we were in Fredericksburg, I remember that was when they had the Canadian fires. Yeah. Right, you know, and, and uh, you know, warping the whole uh, sky. Um, <laughs> it's crazy. Yeah. I don't think people who love the heat should be trusted. I just want to throw that out. <laughs> <laughs> it's your northern imperialism. <laughs> Uh, you know, we, we get to earn the right to be snarky in the summer when I deal with uh, seven months of cold in Wisconsin. So, you know, or eight, really. So. Well, your your summers are, are the most beautiful. Um, I mean, I really do like our summers. It's worth it for me. But, yeah. Did, did you ever see the, uh, the uh, Apple TV series Extrapolation? No. I, I recommended this to, to everybody. It's a TV show. It's eight episodes about the future of climate change. And it, it's it's uneven, but the best parts are terrific, and it's just it's an amazing thing that they did. They threw a ton of money and Hollywood stars in it. But one of my favorite episodes is about um, the slow decay of Miami as people are being uh, exfiltrated from it. And they, they mention at one point that they've got a uh, the feds have a program which will uh, relocate you from Miami to Duluth. And uh, one of the characters says, "I especially like the fact that they throw in a free rifle." <laughs> These guys know they're uh, American, you know, very well. <laughs> yeah. yeah, I got to run too. I'm teaching an AI and digital storytelling class. So um, right. great for the chat. See y'all later. Bye, Mark. Bye. Bye, Brian. Thank you both for coming. Thank you for hosting. And uh, everyone, be well and be safe. Absolutely. Bye-bye. Wow, how about that? Yeah. Info called himself. <laughs> Love it. Well, you know, I think that's probably about as good a time to wrap things up as any. We're just about at the top of the hour. And uh, thanks, everyone, for uh, 
for chatting about the their their own navigation of this weird social space right now and everything else that we talked about. Um, and uh, as always, I had fun with it. And uh, I'm gonna hit stop recording. And I just wish we could yeah. save the chat. Because that's the best part right now. I'm, people, you're missing out. Tom is on fire in the chat. Clearly, I've missed Twitter. I mean, <laughs> <laughs> well, you know, you can just come here at any point and put stuff in the chat. <laughs> I'm talking trash about whatever. It's wonderful. Jim quits. <laughs> I gotta see if that's in the Library of Congress. I always mean to like see if I can get that Twitter stuff. I would love to see that again. I've never, I've never gone through with it. <laughs> I want to see the sequel to National Treasure focused around recovering that. Um, <laughs> <laughs> it's very low stakes, unfortunately, but <laughs> I think I could pull off a Nicolas Cage style. <laughs> I can see you in a snakeskin jacket for sure. <laughs>